Ann Tutwiler, I'm Director General for Bioversity International. I think when we're, we're talking about trying to get all of these different communities to work together, what's very important is to have goals that all of them can be aspiring to and using those goals to help align the activities. And the one thing I didn't hear in any of the discussions was really how are communities going to set those concrete goals about what they want to do in terms of employment, in terms of income generation, development, et cetera, so that it can be the, the magnet that draws everyone together and, and helps uh, align the coordination that, that you all are talking about that is so complex. Thanks, Brian Baldwin from International Fund for Agricultural Development. Question for Julio. Thank you very much, Julio, for, for making that definition of territorial quite, quite, quite clear. Um, I am Scottish, not even English. Uh, so to answer Frederick's question, it works perfectly in Scottish and English. So thank you for that. But importantly, Julio, what you talked about was and addressed some of the questions that Frederick mentioned about how we address urban-rural problems and how we address issues of employment, which I think the territorial approach can answer addresses also issues that are coming out in the post-215 agenda of inclusion and addressing inequality. So I would specifically ask you, Julio, in your work in, in Latin America, have you thought about how we can translate some of your findings into some of the, go not the goals, but the targets and indicators that we need to underlie for the 215 agenda? Thank you. Ben Ramalingam, independent researcher. And my question is for all of you, and it's really the point of time. Uh, the point was made earlier on, I think, by Bruno, uh, about the, the need for time, uh, sorry, by Julio, about the need for time when thinking about rural development, when thinking about territorial development, that it takes place over decades, not, not years. Um, but there's also an issue of time when it comes to multidimensional uh, coordination. Uh, even in developed country settings like in the UK, trying to get the Department of Transport to coordinate with the Department of Environment can, t can be a 15, 20 year program of, of collaboration, coordination, trust building and so on. So that, that issue also takes a lot of time. Um, I just want to hear your reflections on that. I have one question, two comments. Um, number one, I think it's very important that... Oh, oh, oh. Oh, okay, Mauro from uh, Italian Cooperation. Um, so before uh, posing the first question very briefly, I think it's fundamental that the issues of uh, uh, holistic paralysis has been brought. I would use a French word, gaspillage, wastage because it's a good way uh, if the project they are not focused to waste an amount of money. It's a very bureaucratic way you know, to make it correct, but it's an unfair way for the beneficiary. Having said that very directly, I have two questions. The number one, um, um, or I can start uh, with the co two comments. Uh, the first comment, I think that the um, uh, demographical dimension has been put very clear. And this means that we have to invest more and more also because traditional knowledge is, is going to be loose very fast on education, investment in education. Because otherwise, I don't think the new generation will be ready uh, to, to meet the, uh, the, the, the challenge. The second issue um, is uh, about territorial approach. Uh, nevertheless, will require sound sectoral policy, nevertheless. And I think uh, this is the case, especially in Africa. And the Conakry as example is, uh, is, is a fundamental. It's true, many people move uh, because of, uh, of, um, um, of a mining. But if there are some policies, there could be investment and way to uh, set it back. Thank you. Julian Kwan, Natural Resource Institute in, in UK. Uh, just reflecting briefly on some of the parallels between Latin America and Africa, I think Obviously, the speakers have made clear that the Africa is in a transition and in many, f in many respects, a territorial approach could have strong advantages. But there are a number of drivers, and I wonder if the panel might be able to comment on this, that distinguish Africa. Um, one is the effect of conflict. Another, the sheer weight and importance of external aid and increasingly external commercial investment in mining and agriculture. Uh, and the effect of climate change and weather extremes. And one of the effects of these is perhaps to concentrate donor thinking and approaches very much at the national level. So these are things which uh, only seem to be tractable through at national level. 
but I wonder what the panel might suggest about how donors and the international community can effectively support territorial approaches and build territorial institutions at the subnational level, uh, because these are problems which, in fact, may be amenable to a territorial solution and macro-level policy, national-level policy may not be enough to resolve problems of climate resilience and adaptation which are local in nature, conflicts, political conflict which has ethnic religious dimensions very mo often local in nature. Thank you. My name is Ernan O'Cleary from Irish Aid. I have a couple of questions really that I, I'd, I'd like to direct towards uh, Julio. Um, Irish Aid actually, um, territorial development or what we would call local or district based development has been a key part of our program, our bilateral programs, all of them probably for the last 25 or 30 years and continues to be even as we've moved into general budget support and sector programs we've always kept a significant component of our programs uh, based at, um, uh, at local level. Uh, and um, mostly in African countries, in Eastern and, s and Southern Africa. And the kind of constraints we, we, we see in promoting uh, this sort of development approach uh, is really about the, the um, lack of mandate and the lack of ability of local institutions to manage uh, their own development. And there's very practical issues which prescribe uh, or which um, uh, limit that. Things like uh, fiscal autonomy. Um, uh, the ability to raise and to allocate revenues. And in fact, when we see decentralization programs, we often see that although in some sense there's a decentralization of decision making, actually all of the budget is pre-spent by the time it gets down. It's, all, it's only for uh, recurrent expenditures, it's only for wages and things like that. So there's very little discretionary funding that allows uh, a, a local authority to, to take decisions to make options. They can't sack half the teachers in order to build an irrigation system, uh, those sorts of issues. Also, the whole question of policy autonomy. You know, uh, general, uh, not only policy, but policy and political autonomy at local level, both the, the policy, um, the sectoral policies, uh, and the political institutions tend to be very strongly centralized. So, it, so it's quite difficult to get um, uh, to get adequate autonomy for um, uh, for adaptive, responsive uh, local politics and uh, and local policy making. Uh, there's also the question of uh, the I, I was interested by the question: of Why do the red zones stay red? Uh, why do they stay poor? And th and looking at it from a budget perspective, the reason they stay poor is because they are poor. Uh, you know, budgets tend to be incrementalist. A public budget doesn't increase if you don't have the hospitals uh, in which the money will be spent. They don't increase if you don't have the schools. So poorly served places do not tend to get uh, large amounts of budgetary um, uh, allocations. And the last point, is, uh, what I was asking about is how do you uh, overcome these things in practice, which you seem to have managed to do in the Latin American experience. And the last question is really how do you provide the incentives for building the social coalition, for, for getting that, how do you provide the incentives to the political and administrative institutions at local level uh, to get that kind of social inclusion and to get uh, a, a participatory uh, planning approaches? Thanks. My name is Birgit Gerhardus. I'm from the German Ministry for Development Cooperation. My questions are in the same direction because Julio talked a lot about the importance of social cohesion, not social cohesion, co yeah, coalitions. Uh, so would you consider it as a prerequisite that uh, there are already local authorities in place, more or less well-functioning? Um, since you talked about the time span it needs to build these, I'm wondering if you can engage in, in the absence of such uh, authorities. So is there a sequencing in the activities, yes or no? Thank you. Tierra Fue Trapasso from the OECD. Three reflections. The different, it would be important to distinguish between community-based processes and policies and territorial approach, which is not the same thing. The, um, the new patterns, in a sense, the Africa and Latin America have uh, display dynamics that are not in the memories of uh, OECD countries, so there is need for a broader reflection of rural development that includes the specificities of these places. And, uh, 
Uh, just uh, a problem about definitions. In the sense, we I was in 2010 in India to participate into a rural development conference with India, Brazil, South Africa, and China, and all four countries were very. You know, uh, they wanted to talk about rural development to define a, a common framework for rural development, but ne they never you know, achieved this result because when Brazil was talking about rural development, it was completely different from what China intended as rural development. It was completely different from what South Africa and the others. So it, it's important to create uh, also a common forum uh, to discuss this kind of issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we, we got... Uh question and comments from eight people from the audience, which means an average of a 16 uh, question and issue to raise. So feel free not to answer now to the question and issue wha that was raised. We will have uh, hopefully coffee break. <laughs> uh, but uh, so we have uh, five minutes for you three uh, choosing the, the best, the most important uh, issues. <laughs> So uh, uh, I, I will not try to summarize and group them. It will last time. Julio, you have. Thank you. Uh, I'll answer those that were direct questions, and I'll be happy to engage afterwards with anybody. Uh, Anne, uh, uh, and I think this in part also answers some of the concerns of our colleague from Irish Aid. I think that communities can develop shared goals if they really have uh, responsibility to do so and most importantly if they have real resources uh, real budgets that they can make decisions upon freely if you just invite them to meetings to agree on objectives etc it's one thing if you say there's a budget after that meeting that's a whole totally new, new dynamic so I think it's not only the capacity, the authority, but also the resources to make decisions upon. A lot of mistakes will be made, but that's development. I think that uh, I want to also address Brian's question about 2015. Well, we're starting to engage in this post-2015 uh, di discussion, and I just one key word that I would like to say because of time. We must make sure that at least some of the goals, in terms of indicators, etc., are broken down. Uh, and we don't anymore only are happy with national averages. Because in this world of huge inequalities, not only territorial, but social, gender, etc., <coughs> we need these goals to be much more broken down than we had with the Millennium Development Goals. I think that would be great progress. Um, the question about social coalitions, are they a prerequisite? No, I don't think, I mean, it would be ideal if we had this social uh, capacity in every single territory, but no, I think this in itself is an outcome of the process. As, as um, in, in the case of Ben's question, the capacity to coordinate. If we, if we, if we take that as a prerequisite, then we'll never start. Development coordination is also an outcome of the process. I think those were some of the direct questions that were asked to me. Okay, a, a, a quick comment. Um, the, the shift from uh, sectoral approaches to territorial approaches, of course, needs to uh, engage in uh, holistic approaches, uh, as you said. But uh, uh, holistic approaches can't be the objective. If not, it's gaspillage and uh, only blah blah. Okay, so holistic approaches are needed to be able to identify prior pri priorities and the right sequencing. If and so uh, all of this is the issue of of a, of a process. And uh, if I refer to Stiglitz when he he did his prebrish lecture at INCTAD a couple of years ago, he said that public policy as a process is a public good and need, needs a strong public support and public funding. It's a process because it's through the dialogue between stakeholders that you are able to have a shared vision on objectives depending of opportunities and constraints and you are able to identify priorities and the right sequencing. I think that's it's all the idea of this type of process and having a territorial approach is the good way to 
be able to deal with the problems at different scales, local, regional, national governments. Thank you, Bruno. And finally, uh, Esterine, you will have the, the final word. Well, that's an honor. Thank you. Um, I, I think on the issue of um, territorial planning and sectoral, territorial approach and sectoral um, policy um, approach, uh, I think the issue probably w is to look, I mean, uh, it's important to have robust sectoral policies. But it's not, it's, it's important to see how those policies are going to be implemented at different levels and scales. And I think for that then you need to look at the territorial approach. So you have to be able to marry the two if you really want to get into implementation. So if we are talking about action, I could say if I take again the case of CADAP, if we are going to move beyond compacts to action, then we have to look at the implementation strategies that we have. And that will necessarily include looking at your stakeholder, your multi-sectoral approach. And, and that's what I think Guinea is trying to do, overlaying the CADAP investment um, plans within a territorial space, um, recognizing the other economic activities and the other social dynamics that are within that space. Um, I, the, the last thing I would like to say, given the fact that I have this opportunity to end this session, is to say the, the issue of coordination is very important. I'm not so sure whether the coordination, for instance, between the Development Partners Task Team in CADAP and the Global Donor Platform is optimal. I think that could be improved um, so that we can deal with the issue of um, looking towards optimal delivery of support from our partners.